this off, I'm going to put everyone on mute. I'm going to Margo. I'm going to unmute you and you're ready to go. All right. Oops, I almost left the meeting instead of went to <laughs> share screen. Okay, here we go. The planning committee was um, made up of agricultural, business, tribal governments, federal government, state government, including state lands that owns most of the Owens Lake, um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, local governments, the Inyo County, um, environmental NGOs that I mentioned before, including uh, also the Native Plant Society, open space uh, NGOs, energy uh, interests, including LADWP, as well as community and education groups. So it was very broad and everyone came together. And so you had the Owens Lake master planning process beginning. Dust control, which was mandated by the state implementation plan. You had habitat that was the interest of some of the NGOs. You had other public trust resources that are the interests of the state lands, along with habitat, you have aesthetics, public access and cultural resources. DWP was interested not only in controlling the dust, but also <laughs> they didn't want to use that much water. So their interest is in a reduction of water. And the Great Basin Air Pollution Control Program simply wants to control the dust. If they could, they would flood that whole lake. But this is the group and these are the processes and the interests that came together. The grazers were mostly on the edges and not so much in the project area, as well as the Rio Tinto mine, also not exactly in the dust control area, but an interested party in attending with good input from them as well. So when I think about Biona, I think, what happened? You know, there was a public process, but I think it was much more of a top-down process and the public just listened. Um, I could be wrong, but we can talk about that in the questions. Um, because you all were there more than I was, because I was in Owens Lake. Um, so here's how Owens Lake did it. The, there was a facilitator, an important factor, a non-interested, non-biased facilitator. So working together, the facilitator and participants will work together to create a problem solving environment and to implement these agreements to that aim. And this is what the group agreed to in terms of how we would conduct ourselves in the meetings. You know, listen and openly discuss the issues with others holding diverse views. View disagreements as problems to be solved rather than battles to be won. Refrain from ascribing motives or intentions to other participants. I think, you know, these first three are just like, okay, that's what we need to do. Respect the integrity and values of other participants. And then we get into <clears throat> the nuts and bolts of honor time. Don't waste people's time. Don't talk forever. Um, use conversational courtesy. Appreciate humor, but don't engage in humor at the expense of others and, uh, and keep your cell phone silent. 
this was the working nuts and bolts. There's other aspects to this planning process. There was a charter, there were agreements on if you don't agree, if there's not 100% consensus, what do we do then? And it goes through a whole process. Work groups were part of that process. So the entire almost 40 member stakeholder group couldn't know everything about all the aspects of Owens Lake. So work groups were formed as necessary during the process of the master planning. So there was a habitat work group and they were responsible for developing uh, you know, methods to support and, and uh, preserve habitat. And at first, um, you know, they were thinking of a preserve, like designate an area as a preserve. But what we finally, after several years, came up with a habitat suitability model across the whole lake. So it's a whole landscape scale model that guides uh, management of each of the dust control areas. And then others um, provide advice on implementation, uh, enhance strategies, and develop an adaptive management strategy. The dust control work group had to work, mostly this was Great Basin and uh, state lands and the uh, air, air sciences and LADWP working on new and modified best available control methods. So this was timing and amount of each new or modified BACM, how you test the BACMs, timing of testing, et cetera, and how testing is perceived in terms of designated areas. Because remember while we're in this planning group and, and as we're implementing dust control, the Great Basin Air Quality Pollution Control Board is, is designating new areas every few years. So it's not a static, well, we'll wait for 15 years and then we'll start. No, we're working, we're moving and doing. And there was also a public access and recreation group and uh, that was charged with developing how and where to um, incorporate public access. And all of these included cultural resources because you can't really move out there. You have to have monitoring and you have to work with the tribes on where the sensitive areas are. It is especially in public access. So, Here's a uh, birders out on a big day, counting birds and uh, working, everyone working together. Here's designated dust control units. Uh, we had much as the larger planning committee, we had uh, selected a person to run our meetings. And this person was with um, the Eastern Sierra Audubon, um, a retired um, lawyer. He is very good at running meetings, at summing up, at keeping everything on an even keel. So our small work group was run similarly to the larger planning committee. Um, I was part of it in that I was a scientist. I was still working for DWP, but we all trusted each other in, in these groups. And, um, you know, at first it's, it's odd. You think, well, who's the public? <laughs> you kind of have a chip on your shoulder because you've been working out there uh, just with your team and you think now I have to add this. It's already hard enough working on Owens Lake. But it really was so instructive and so such a good process. Um, 
and you had to be prepared. You had to be prepared for the planning committee meetings. Uh, you had to read everything they sent. And you also had to be prepared for our habitat work group meetings. So this is an example of once we decided not to designate one area. And one of the reasons we decided not to designate just one area as a preserve is that when dust control first started in 2000 in the mitigation, they had said this will be 2,000 acres will be designated for for birds and uh, okay that was designated for birds and will be managed for birds but guess what the birds didn't like it so then what so we took the whole lake and applied uh, a habitat suitability model and what that is is you get parameters. In this case, I'm showing you the Owens Lake Meadow Guild. So guild members are, excuse me, Tule elk, Owens Valley vole, other rodents and various reptiles, northern harrier, savanna sparrow, burrowing owl, and other ground nesting birds, as well as rare plants in wet to drier meadows. So you get a full, um, range of species here and wildlife that you have to consider. So the parameters are vegetation cover, species diversity of the vegetation, the structure, was it, did it have some tall, some short, and then the vegetated topographic diversity. And this, you evaluate each of these parameters based on a zero to one, and you give it a score. And so each of these uh, dust control areas were given a score. The darker green is a higher score than the lighter green. So some have no score whatsoever because they're beyond the beyond for plants. Plants don't wanna be in there at all. So this is what a lake-wide and we also measured right up to the planning uh, area was to the old lake edge at 3600 uh, elevation. And so it includes the existing seeps and springs along the edge of the lake. So not only the dust control areas, but the existing so that they could be monitored and preserved. So the planning committee continued on until 2013. And at that time, they agreed on project objectives and planning framework. But there was a sticking point and it's still being uh, worked out at this point, and so it became the master project. And so we wrote up, and I was one of the people that, for some reason, had to write up the collaboration report with my writing partner, Andrea Schmid. Um, so we, we took what was all agreed upon and put it into this report on Owens Lake. And in 2015, there was a CEQA notice for preparation of the master project based mostly on the frameworks developed here. Um, I'm just showing you this as a background. So here we are in 2010, starting on the master planning and the habitat work group is in the sort of magenta color here. Uh, we started in 2014 to work at the request of another work group, the groundwater work group. Uh, they wanted to know how much water, how much water could a seeper spring uh, get away with not having if DWP was going to pump groundwater. And so we had to develop this uh, 
we didn't know the answer. So we had to take several years to figure out how we would even approach that question. And we came up with some great tools and a, a great resource protection plan that now they've taken into the groundwater work group. So that's how things can work together. Uh, different work groups can utilize technology, have speakers come in from the other work groups. So I'm just showing you the amount of time these things take. Uh, a long time. We in the habitat work group uh, developed an adaptive management for our habitat suitability model. So we identified the management priorities for each of the six guilds of, of uh, birds and animals. We then developed the management strategies and actions, as you saw in the habitat suitability model. We implement and monitor. So each criteria or parameter that is described for each guild is some parameter that can be measured either monthly or quarterly, seasonally, annually. It can be measured. This is the point. It can be measured and it can be measured without. Um, and really without great, I mean, there's effort in it, but it's not an irresponsible amount of measurement. So that was where you could say, well, this is a proxy. Um, we can't measure brine flies, for instance, that are very important to shorebirds. That's very time consuming and difficult to do, but we can measure salinity all the time. And that tells us if we have good brine fly habitat or not. So those are the types of proxies we can use for um, different aspects and make it measurable and make it doable. And then the reports can come annually and can be an adjusted depending on the effectiveness monitoring. So the validation of the model and the annual effectiveness monitoring is coming from, you know, counting, for instance, birds, which is done frequently. And here we have some stilts, black neck stilts. So what came out of the habitat work group uh, and the planning committee was the planning framework. So we ended up with five focal species um, of guilds, breeding waterfowl, that's mallard, and ducks, gadwalls, migrating waterfowl, that's northern shovelers, snowy, western snowy plover has its own guild. Now it's a shorebird and it breeds there, and so do the avocets. But we created the first, we call it 1.0 habitat suitability model, and we had outside scientists review it. Then we made adjustments. We had, based on their recommendations, we had Habitat Suitability Model 2.0. And a few years later, we sent it off to Point Blue, formerly Point Reyes Bird Observatory. And Point Blue uh, went through the model with a fine tooth comb. And so we made the adjustments, worked with them back and forth, the whole habitat working group, and came up with 3.0. And we're getting ready, I think, uh, for a 3.1, perhaps. And that would be uh, based more on bird counts um, and small adjustments. Because remember, none of these None of these focal guilds 
have been weighted. They're all this equally important at this point. But there could be a case made for snowy plovers being weighted because of their um, designation by the state. Um, so that's sort of where we are. Um, we're years into the monitoring and adaptive management and the adjustments. And here's the latest adjustment of 3.0, making the snowy plover habitat suitability model just its own guild and avocets went into uh, the migrating. So, you know, this is not just based on our own, but independent scientific review and uh, point blue being quite respected. The planning framework continues for water conservation and uh, you know, trying to get modified or transition water intensive dust control measures uh, to use less water. So they have something called a TWB2, which is um, a tillage <laughs> where you till the soil in great blocks. So it can only be in the clay soils. You till it and it, you leave it rough like that. And then it doesn't blow and it doesn't form the salt crust. But because uh, Great Basin Air Pollution District wants some backup, there is tillage with backum backup. So that's shallow flood. So if it starts to blow, you can immediately shallow flood the tillage area. I told you nothing was easy out here. <laughs> and all of these changes would then um, have to be evaluated within the habitat suitability model because we've committed to maintaining the value across the lake for each of the yields. And that means uh, we have to make something better somewhere else if we're gonna take water away. So that's the balance. Um, right now we have three technical work groups going, uh, the habitat work group, the groundwater work group, which we are supplying information to, and then uh, I think public access and recreation is still uh, operating. Although, they, here is the public access points for the 110 square miles. Uh, I just put this up here because even at Owens Lake, as big as it is, nobody wants the public running amok amongst the birds' habitat or the meadow voles' habitat. So here it is, the main highway through all the dust control and you can enter on sulfate road, you can enter at Dirty Sock Springs or at Willow Dip Lake Minerals Road and you can drive through and out and here's uh, Brady Highway up at the north end of the lake. And there are some areas here about this area where you can get a good view. There's a good uh, overlook, um, nice public trail through there. So why did I tell you all this? Well, because it occurred to me that Biona, is there the will for a collaborative approach among CDFW, state lands, LA County, all the nonprofits and the private businesses. Is there that will? I don't know. You're the model for what we were supposed to have and, and you showed it works. So if we can just get back there. So at the Coastal Commission meeting, 
I just blurted it out. I said, you know, oh, yes, people, people think that it couldn't work, but it did work in a, in a really, you know, acrimonious place.